Chelsea Football Club are a mess. They've brought in about a thousand new players, still can't get in the top half, and now Pochettino's had enough. And so I've been drafted in to get Chelsea back to being one of Europe's elite and maybe win a trophy along the way. And of course, if you're looking forward to a brand new Chelsea career mode, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow along for the rest of the series. And let's get stuck into it. Now, as everyone knows, Chelsea have signed a bucket load of new players. And yet it could still be argued that looking at the squad, this is one of the worst Chelsea teams in years. They've got an 81 rated on loan Kepper as their highest rated goalkeeper, with a newcomer Robert Sanchez clearly not going to be good enough in the long term to fill the void between the sticks. Ben Chilwell was a fairly decent option at left back, but with the club desperate to try and get rid of Kukurea in real life, and with an unproven Ian Matson in reserve, time will tell whether he'll be good enough to even make the starting eleven. Now there can be no denying that Thiago Silva is a world-class centre-back, but with him being 38 years of age and retiring at the end of the season, we are definitely going to be looking to try and find a replacement for him at the back. Now to be fair, they do have quite a large host of young and up-and-coming players, the likes of Axel de Sassi, the 22-year-old Frenchman Benoit Badiashile, another 22-year-old Frenchman Wesley Fofana, who unfortunately has been victim to several injuries over the last couple of seasons, and finally a 20-year-old Englishman in Levi Colwell, who impressed quite a lot last season on loan at Brighton. However, whether any of these players are truly good enough to make the grade in the immediate term, I'm not quite sure, so let me know down in the comments below, are there anyone in particular that you think I should bring in, and is centre-back a crucial position for us to target at the start of the summer transfer window. Now obviously at right back, Reese James is one of the best players at the club and in real life, Mal Augusto has actually been impressing quite a lot so I think we're pretty well stocked in that department. And we've got some fairly decent players in midfield with the likes of Moises Caicedo and the 22 year old Enzo Fernandez being bought for £100 million each respectively plus an ever improving Conor Gallagher. I think we're going to be okay in central midfield for now. A question I do have though is what to do with this man, an exciting prospect and someone who has got a big future at Chelsea but does he have a future in our very first season? Again, let me know down below. Should I keep him at the club? Should I perhaps look to loan him out to get first team football in a different team? Let me know what you think. Now naturally Raheem Sterling is a left winger but he does have the versatility to play on the left and on the right and down the middle and in real life he's playing for Chelsea on the right hand side as well. Plus, he is our best attacking midfielder at the moment. However, with us only having a 77-rated Noni Madueke and Cole Palmer, who despite Chelsea paying over £40 million for in real life, is only rated 67, is the right-hand side of midfield an area that we need to improve. Now, whilst Mudrick hasn't exactly hit the heights that would have been expected of him in real life since joining Chelsea, on this game, he does have that something special, and with him only being 22 years of age, does have time on his side, so I'm confident he will be a fixture for the long term at this club. However, again, with Sterling more likely to play on the right-hand side, do I potentially need to look at bringing in another left-winger to try and compete with this man over the course of the season. And finally up front with Romelu Lukaku out on loan to Roma in real life. That only leaves the likes of Armando Broja and Nicholas Jackson up front. And obviously striker is a key position that Chelsea are really struggling with in real life. Now Christopher Nkunku has an incredible rating and clearly has that something special and can play up front as well. However, my understanding was that Chelsea were bringing him in to play in the hole behind the striker. So again, let me know down in the comments below, where do you think I should be playing this man? Should I play him in central attacking midfield? Or should I look to play him as our lone striker up front? So looking through the overall starting 11 and the substitutes and the reserves, I think it's pretty obvious that we're going to need to start trying to delve into the transfer market. Goalkeeper for me is probably going to be my number one priority as I really don't think Robert Sanchez is going to be our long-term answer between the sticks. There might be some improvements that are needed at centre-back, especially with Thiago Silva coming to the end of his career. Perhaps some improvements might need to be made on the left-hand side of my defence as well as the left-hand side and right-hand side of my midfield. Plus, depending on your thoughts on Christopher for Nkunku, we may well want to look for another striker to lead the line for us. So of course, as ever, let me know down in the comments below who you want to be seeing plying their trade in a Chelsea shirt this season. Now every good team needs a proper system, and in typical Pochettino style, I am going to stick with a high-pressing, attacking philosophy to try and get the best out of my young players. And in order to implement that system, I am going to try and look to bring in the best coaching that I have available. Now, I still haven't quite worked out whether tactical vision or stars are the best way to go. Granted, you'll want a combination of the two, but I'm still not quite sure whether one is more important than the other. Now, I'm looking for an attacking coach, but you'll see on the left-hand side that there's only two available who have some sort of knowledge in gagan pressing, and both of them are pretty naff when it comes to stars. So instead, I think I'm going to go for this Sean King guy, while Whilst he doesn't offer us incredible knowledge of Gagan pressing, he's got a pretty balanced tactical vision and he's got expert stars right across the board. And you'll see I've done the exact same thing across the midfield, the defence and in goal. However, the big thing you'll see is that at the moment I've only decided to hire just five coaches. And that is simply because looking through the rest of the coaches on this list, they're all pretty naff. 
They've either got pretty poor star rating or those that actually do have a half decent star rating don't exactly have any decent knowledge whatsoever. So I think right now I'm still unsure about the true value of what these coaches offer. So I'm going to stick to just the five at the moment, see how we play out over the course of the next few episodes and then make a decision later on as to whether or not I'm going to add any more. Now I've had a word with the scouts and obviously I've come up with a huge long list of players who may well be of use to the club moving forward. However, before we start looking at our incoming transfers, first things first, we've got to look at some of the players who will be heading out the door this summer. And there's only really three of any major notes. Firstly, our reserve goalkeeper Marcus Bettinelli departs the club for 810 grand. After being left out of Chelsea's Premier League squad in real life, Malang Saar departs to Fenerbahce for 5.5. And it looks like Manchester United's recruitment strategy has been just as shaky as Chelsea's have been over the last few years, as they have decided to bring in the much maligned Mark Kukurea for 32.3 million pound. And with those departures, the board have allowed us a whopping 185 £5 million pounds still left to spend. Now I've mentioned I've got a whole host of different players all shortlisted playing in a variety of different positions. However, for me, my number one priority in the position that I do want to start off with in this transfer window is in goal. Now with Alex Merritt being 26 years of age and impressing at Napoli last season, he could well be a decent option. And similar to him, having broken to the setup in the national squad for Spain, Unai Simon is impressing for Atletico Bilbao. Marmadashvili is another goalkeeper impressing in the Liga, and with him only being 22 years of age, he's got time on his side to continue his development. But for me, the 25-year-old, 87-rated Gregor Kobel stands out by an absolute mile. He has every single stat that a goalkeeper would realistically want, and he is someone who would immediately come in and improve our starting eleven. However, with his asking price being around £108 million, whilst Todd Bowley might be okay to spend that sort of money, I'm not quite sure I want to do that yet in this career mode, with a lot of other areas of my squad still needing to be developed. So instead, I've decided to go for a man who is making waves at both club and international level. A man who has been regularly linked with a variety of different English clubs over the course of the real-life summer transfer window, and a man who I'm sure will be absolutely desperate to finally be able to make the move to the Premier League. He's a goalkeeper who has the potential to be an absolute superstar and someone who I'm confident will fit in like a glove at Chelsea Football Club. It is the Portuguese sensation Diogo Jota who will be joining Chelsea in a deal worth £43.5 million. As you saw in his intro, he will immediately come in and become our number one, as well as becoming the best goalkeeper at the club. He's got age on his side, only being 23 years of age, and he's got more than enough potential to develop into a world-class goalkeeper. And of course, it's a no-brainer that he will immediately come in and replace Robert Sanchez in between the sticks. And whilst clearly there is still a wide variety of different positions that I can upgrade, I think for this episode, I'm going to leave Diogo Jota as being my one and only signing so far and that is simply because I want to give you guys the opportunity to decide who will be coming in to play for Chelsea Football Club this season again let me know down in the comments below who you think would be the best players for the best positions for this team and of course I will be sure to sign them and so with the players ready ahead of pre-season and the fans keen to see what sort of impression I'm going to have in my first game as Chelsea manager it turns out to be Christopher and Kunku who makes a lasting impression with two absolute screamers to open up his Chelsea account and Diogo Costa's also keen to start off his Chelsea career in good standing pulling off some fabulous saves however it's still clear to see that the defence is still a bit of a shambles and Mudrick also seems to be picking up from where he left off in real life with him still yet to ignite his Chelsea career however on the completion of pre-season one interesting piece of news is an offer from Borussia Dortmund for Raheem Sterling for £40.4 million however with him being our best winger and one of the best players at the club plus playing incredibly well for Chelsea in real life Unfortunately, it's a deal that I'm probably going to have to think about turning down. It has, however, got me thinking about his long-term future at the club, and with him being 28 years of age, it's highly unlikely that he's going to improve any more on his 83 rating. So let me know down in the comments below what you think I should do with Raheem Sterling. Should I continue to keep him at the club for the remainder of the season, or should I think about considering putting him on the transfer list and trying to cash in on our English international? Now, having given us such a big transfer budget to spend, I'm actually relatively comfortable with some of the objectives that the board have given us. With them wanting us to achieve a Champions League place in the Premier League and win the FA Cup this season, I think that is pretty doable for a club of our stature. However, if we are going to do that, we're going to have to make sure that the tactics put in place are the right ones for us to achieve our goals. Starting off with the formation, I think for now I am going to stick with this 
4-2-3-1 that Pochettino likes to use. Obviously, we're playing a high-press system, so I'm going to push the defensive depth right the way up to 75. I want to make sure in our offensive build-up we've got plenty of forward runs from more of our deeper players, as well as trying to get as many players in the box as possible to take advantage of overload situations. Now, my strikers have got enough pace that they should be able to get in behind the defence, and I want to give Enzo Fernandez licence just to roam around the pitch to try and pick up some decent positions. Naturally, the likes of Mudrich and Sterling will be cutting inside at all opportunities, and that means I'm going to be relying on my fullbacks to create width, constantly overlapping them to try and create some spaces out wide. I think for now I'm pretty comfortable with this formation. Obviously, we'll see how it pans out in our opening game of the season, but again, let me know down in the comments below if there's any other way you want to see this Chelsea team set up, or if you think you could do any better with some of the players we've got available. And in fact, I'm feeling so confident in this system and my own managerial abilities that I have decided to call a press conference ahead of our first game of the season to try and rally the troops. As whilst the board want us only to qualify for the Champions League, I'm confident we might even be able to go one step further and challenge for the title. But with Liverpool standing in our way in our opening game of the season, my start to life in Chelsea colours perhaps couldn't get any more difficult. Diogo Costa, of course, will get his first opportunity to make his debut in a Chelsea shirt. Our defence is made up of the likes of Rhys James, De Sassi, Silva and Ben Chilwell. I've dropped Enzo Fernandez into the centre of midfield to partner Caicedo, with Christopher and Kunku dropping into the central attacking midfield position being flanked by the likes of Raheem Sterling and Mudrik on the left hand side and it will be Nicholas Jackson who will get the opportunity to lead the line for us today. Alexander-Arnold down the line into Mo Salah, Thiago, lovely reverse pass back to the Egyptian man and look at him storming down this left hand side, he's got the beating of Thiago Silva for pace into Diogo Jota, Jota into the box, what a slide tackle, how important that was but we still can't clear our lines, what a save from Diogo Costa. Well it's been an electric start for Liverpool in the opening seven minutes here and they don't look like they're about to relent as it's a ball into the box from Mo Salah headed away by uh, De Sassi yet again but only out as far as Luis Diaz, nice turn away from my midfield and again we just about managed to block but we're living on the edge here and again it's poor into Thiago this time, De Sassi again with a massive clearance and Kunku for his first real touch in a Chelsea shirt fires a wonderful ball out to Raheem Sterling, he's got flanked by uh, Rhys James and Rhys James is going to try and play a ball back into Sterling, lovely done into the path of Nkunku again who tries to hit it with his left, this time he's blocked Caicedo from distance wide, De Sassi Lovely ball into the path of Rhys James. He's had a fantastic start to this game. Nicholas Jackson into Mudrick. Oh, he gets it all wrong. Mo Salah. Again, he's got the beating of Thiago Silva, who seems to be really struggling at the back. A wonderful ball parked into the box. Kunku out to Rhys James. One touch into Enzo Fernandez. Nice stuff here. Tried to play in. Uh, Raheem Sterling couldn't find him. And now Liverpool will try and hit us on the counter-attack. They've got men forward here. McAllister. McAllister still has it. Nice pass into Luis Diaz. He goes past to Sassi. He can't get past. He can, though. Into Thiago. Into Diogo Jota and Liverpool take the lead and he celebrates as if he's playing a video game it was that easy well it was Luis Diaz a lovely ball into the path of Thiago and I wondered what on earth he was doing passing it back but seemingly he was one step ahead of me and he was one step ahead of Diogo Costa unfortunately he's not able to keep a clean sheet in his debut Klopp celebrates 1-0 Liverpool Raheem Sterling has it on the right hand side plays it back into Rhys James Rhys James with the first time ball in oh it's headed away there by Alexander Arnold not that far and Kunku off to Alisson oh it's just we cannot seem to get there and in the end it's cleared away by Andrew Robertson Virgil van Dijk he's been hunted down by Christopher and Kunku but he's done a really good job of managing to weave away and he's passed it to Robertson and now Liverpool have beaten the Chelsea press really nicely but not in nice enough as Enzo Fernandez wins the ball back tries to play it in ah I was trying to play it into Nkunku it was well defended by Liverpool into Robertson again it's Enzo Fernandez with a brilliant challenge Caicedo this time into Mudrick Mudrick tried to play it into Jackson and again the final ball is lacking here McAllister for Liverpool he played a nice ball into Robertson. Robertson turns. He's got runners ahead of him. Can he find them? Yes, he can. He finds Luis Diaz. Into the box goes Luis Diaz. Lovely footwork. Big save. Well, 60 minutes in here. And of the two teams, it looks like Liverpool are more likely to double their advantage rather than us getting back into this game as Mo Salah throws it into the box. It's headed clear. And eventually, it's Nkunku will pick it up and drive away from our penalty area. McAllister. Lovely pass into Jota, and Jota has got the beating for Thiago Silva for pace. No, he doesn't. That is a fantastic piece of recovery defending by the veteran Brazilian. Mo Salah, lovely turn to get away from the substitute Ian Madsen, who's just come on. And that is not the best start you want in Chelsea colours. It's a wonderful ball in. What a save. Just under 10 minutes remaining on the clock here, and Liverpool have got a corner, and it looks like they're going to go short. They do go short to Thiago. He throws it in, though. Headed away by the other substitute, Malo Gusto. And Thiago Silva again is there with a huge challenge, and he brings the ball out of defence and he feeds in Christopher and Kunku, who has now moved up front and Kunku has the pace to get into the box here and Kunku with the run oh and he's put it wide Caicedo Liverpool pressing high determined to keep us 
in our own half. But De Sassi brings it out of defence into Madueke, who's also on as a sub. He gives it away, and that has pretty much been the story of the game. The final ball has been lacking as the referee blows the final whistle. Well, the Liverpool players celebrate a really disappointing start to our Premier League opener. We haven't been able to give the fans what they wanted as at full time it finishes Chelsea nil, Liverpool won. And it's a really disappointing one as well. After giving it large at the start of the game, saying that I thought we could be title contenders, Perhaps we were brought crashing back down to earth with a far superior Liverpool team. However, with such a young team, we are still going to be a work in progress. So I've just got to hope and pray that the fans have the patience to try and wait to see what happens. In spite of conceding a goal, I actually thought defensively we were pretty decent with Thiago Silva and Axel de Sassi forming a formidable partnership at the back. This man in particular was fantastic, and after a bit of a shaky start, I thought in the second half, Thiago Silva was also brilliant as well. However, for me, it was clear in attacking areas with the likes of Raheem Sterling and Mudrik on either side, we just couldn't find the right pass to try and unlock a stubborn Liverpool defence. And it's just so frustrating that Christopher Nkunku couldn't take his pre-season form into the first game against Liverpool as he missed an absolute sitter after doing the hard work to begin with. And so after sorting out the goalkeeping issue, perhaps it is going to be the more attacking areas of the team that I am going to have to consider making some improvements on and my next priority in the transfer window. Speaking of goalkeeper though, I do have to have a quick shout out to this man, Diogo Costa, who will be frustrated conceding a goal on his debut, but perhaps if it wasn't for some of the fine saves that he pulled off, it could have been 3 or 4 nil in the end. So perhaps it will be sooner rather than later that I am going to have to dip my toes back into my shortlist and back into my transfer budget. And from the looks of it so far, I'm probably going to need all the help I can get from you guys. However, ahead of our next game in the Premier League, I am in a defiant mood and I am confident we can turn things around with immediate effect. But with us having to travel to the London Stadium to face off against our London rivals West Ham, I'm sure they will be in no mood to do us any favours whatsoever. There's only two major changes to my starting eleven following that loss against Liverpool and that is that Badi Ashile comes in at the back in place of Thiago Silva who drops to the bench due to a little bit of fatigue. And with Mudrik cutting a frustrating figure on the left-hand side of my midfield, Madueke comes in for his first start in a Chelsea shirt in this career mode. Into Enzo Fernandez, who's dropped deep. Nice ball into Caicedo. And Caicedo with a driving run here, and he's going to hit it with his left. Gets it all wrong, and in the end, it's easy for West Ham to clear. It's like Jonathan David has moved to West Ham, and he plays a nice ball to Jared Bowen on the right-hand side. And he's going to try and drive past Ben Chilwell, and he finds a lovely reverse ball into Lucas Paqueta, who stayed on side. Whips a good ball into the back post, looking for Ben Rama. Takes it down well. Finds a, well, I was going to say he finds a West Ham shirt, but it's well intercepted by Reese James. And now we can try and hit them on the counter-attack. Ball over from Nkunku. It was a poor ball. Again, it's too easy for West Ham to defend, but they make a bit of a meal of it. And eventually, they get the ball back, though. Reese James into Caicedo, almost into Caicedo, but ended up giving it away. And now Jonathan David into Paqueta. And Paqueta is going to try and drive away from De Sassi here. Brilliant recovery defending from the young man. Madueke into Caicedo, who continuously finds himself in advanced positions for a central defensive midfielder. And he now finds a ball back to Madueke. Ball back in. I was looking for the deep run of Christopher Nkunku. Couldn't find him, but again, uh, Caicedo will pick it up. He finds Enzo Fernandez. Doesn't find Enzo Fernandez. Took his eye off the ball. And West Ham clear. Alvarez to try and bring the ball out of defence. Finds Socek. Socek turns. Beautifully done to just skip away from the challenge of Caicedo. Jonathan David into Jared Bowen. Jared Bowen to try and drive to the edge of the box here. But De Sassi again with another brilliant challenge. Chris James. Down the line into Raheem Sterling, who's been uncharacteristically quiet so far in this half. But he sprays a wicked ball all the way out to Ben Chilwell on the left-hand side, who takes it beautifully and goes round the right back. Really nicely done from the Englishman. Fires a ball in, looking for the head of Christopher Nkunku. Couldn't find it, though. Christopher Nkunku wins the ball high up the field and now is trying to drive into the West Ham penalty area. Instead, ah, oh, he's just played behind Nicholas Jackson. That was a golden opportunity to go 1-0 up. Geared for West Ham, brings this one out of defence and is unchallenged and manages to march all the way into my half. Plays the ball into Jonathan David. De Sassi again with a brilliant challenge. That man has been on fire today. Reese James into Nicholas Jackson. He turns, tries to play a ball into Madueke. Does. Back out wide to Ben Chilwell. First time ball in, headed away. Kudos for West Ham. It's De Sassi who's going to try and come across to put a challenge in. He isn't able to though. Socek will pick it up on the edge of the box. Conor Gallagher with a fine sliding challenge, but it's not enough. And Jonathan David into the box. Costa with a huge save. Just over 10 minutes remaining here and the scores remain deadlocked at 0-0 here. Neither team able to break the deadlock as Manoweke heads it away only out as far as uh, Enzo Fernandez. West Ham though still pressing high and still managing to win the ball back. Paqueta almost tried to win it back from 
from Caicedo, but this time he was doing his job correctly and he won the ball well. And now Armando Brozier on as a sub can try and release Madueke down the left-hand side. He does just that. Madueke there doesn't have any options in the centre. Instead, he's going to go round the defender, cuts it back into the path of Enzo Fernandez. Oh, my word, I thought that was going in the top right-hand corner. It's going to be Cole Palmer who's going to take the resulting corner and he fires in a good corner looking for the smallest man on the pitch in Raheem Sterling, who obviously doesn't get to it, but he will get a second bite of the cherry here. Cole Palmer to try and fire it back in. This time looking for Gusto, the right back, who finds himself in the six-yard box, but isn't able to put the ball in the back of the net. And much to the frustration of the Chelsea players, that turned out to be the final attack of the game. It's another really disappointing result and another game with no goal scored. As a full-time at the London Stadium, it finishes West Ham nil, Chelsea nil. It's a frustrating result that leaves us in 13th place after our first two games with only one point on the board. But the biggest issue, as you can see, is the big fat zero under the goals for. And despite having the likes of Raheem Sterling, the young and up-and-coming Senegalese striker Nicholas Jackson, and the 86-rated Christopher Nkunku, we just cannot seem to find the back of the net. Whether it's a striking problem, whether or not it's an attacking midfield problem, or a creative problem from the wings, I'm just not sure what to do. Again, let me know down in the comments below how you would fix the problem, because already just two games in, I'm already running out of ideas. And with 140 £46 million pounds still left to spend, we have the budget to make a real difference to this Chelsea squad. But that is it for today's episode. I hope you've all enjoyed it. If you have, please feel free to like, subscribe and comment. And hopefully, I'll see you again next time for episode two of this brand new Chelsea career mode.